Hi, this is Rudy Besikoff, president of Laney College and host of the President's Podcast on 96.9 FM, KGPC. In October of 2022, I had an opportunity to interview geography professor Mark Razan, and I think you'll enjoy this broadcast. Take care and keep listening to us. Also, if you have a chance, please subscribe to my channel right here on YouTube. Welcome to the President's Desk, heard on 96.9 KGPC and via podcast, where Laney College President Dr. Rudy Besikoff speaks with community members and student leaders. Arlene Lontok and Raya Zion do their part to make the President's Desk run, and the broadcast is supported and co-hosted by Technical Director Felicia Bridges and written, produced, and hosted by President Rudy Besikoff. Pull up a chair and join me and Felicia at the President's Desk today as we welcome Laney College Geography Professor Mark Razan to the show, which you can always catch at 2 a.m. and 2 p.m. Wednesdays on KGPC 96.9 FM in Oakland. Busy at 2 o'clock? Well, rest assured because all of our podcasts are available on demand through iTunes and iHeartRadio, or you can visit us at kgpc969.org to listen to the President's Desk anytime. Want to interact with the show? Email us at laneypodcast at peralta.edu. Like us on Facebook at Laney College President's Desk Podcast or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Laney Podcast. I'm Rudy Besikoff, President of Laney College, a pillar that has been serving the greater Oakland community since 1927 and has been known as Laney College for nearly 65 years. As I mentioned, Felicia Bridges, our all-star technical director, joins me each week behind microphone number four while letting me run the controls. Wow. Felicia, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, particularly since I'm an all-star. There you go. Well, you know what? Speaking of all-stars, we're so glad to have joining us on the show today, Professor Mark Razan, who not only teaches but chairs the geography department at Laney. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm um, great. Glad to be here. Really a great privilege to be with you guys today. All right. So since our audience is really geared toward our students, we'll ask you right off the bat, what are you teaching this semester? I'm continuing to focus on geography, world geography, climate change, and our in touch with the water uh, at our geography lab. But uh, primarily, I'm doing the lecture of Geography One, which is uh, how the planet operates. Follow the energy. You know, you say follow the money. We follow the energy because that describes how everything is going to work, how all the systems are going to work. And basically, we're all energy beings, and we get it all from the sun. So let's start with the ultimate source. Mark, before we get going, there has been a question I've been waiting to ask you, and it's about earthquakes. Oh, we, talk we, about energy, huh? <laughs> we, live, <laughs> we live on some faults, the San Andreas and the Hayward Fault, which is... I'm most concerned about. I grew up right on, literally right on top of the fault. Uh -huh. So what does it look like as far as earthquakes and what are they talking about in your circle? Well, if you grew up, then you know what it's like to feel those 3 a.m. tremors that get your heart racing. And I don't know, you were probably here for the 1992 earthquake. Yes. I yes. Was. So then, you know, you have a taste of it. We live on shaky ground. We truly live on the edge here in the Bay Area, the whole region. In fact, the Bay, I don't know if you know this, Felicia, the Bay is the result of two faults, the San Andreas and Hayward Fault, shaking and dropping down, and that whole center portion, the Bay, fell down and got flooded. So expect an earthquake. The U.S. Geological Survey has a prediction that there's going to be a 6.5 earthquake on the Hayward Fault within the next 30 years, and every year that it doesn't happen, the rate of probability goes up. And I think right around now is that it's around 40%. So 40% in the next 30 years, there'll be a 6.5 earthquake. And if you grew up on the Hayward Fault, you know the Hayward Fault is Highway 13. Wow. Oh, yes, so, sure you know, it, Felicia, great question to open this show and, and, you know, great person to ask it to because in addition to being a professor at Laney College, Professor Razan was recently honored with the Paul Cavell 
Environmental Education Award from the Golden Gate Audubon Society. Mark, could you tell us a little bit about the award and why you won it? Yeah, happy to, and I also feel just so honored to receive that award. Paul Covell uh, was a fixture in the uh, 50s and 60s in the Oakland School District. He was the first naturalist at the Rotary Center for Lake Merritt. And I don't know if you know this, but Lake Merritt is the first national bird sanctuary ever created in the United States. So that goes way back. And it has a whole legacy of history of conservation. So to be honored by the Paul Covell Conservation Education Award was a true honor. Paul Covell used to go into the schools and hold assemblies where all the students would come out and he would bring hawks and butterflies and he would spellbind the Live kids. Live ones? Yeah, you have to. Oh, wow. You have to. Well, you really, students just really relate to seeing nothing more exciting than a, a, a two-foot, three-foot tall great horned owl flapping its wings to get your attention. No kidding. He was a great conservationist and my work along the shores of Laney College Estuary, cleaning up weeds, educating students, taking water quality samples, just focusing students on what it's like to be a scientist, handling data, handling water, and pulling weeds. And that was really fun to get students to pull weeds. And you know what? They complained about it, but they sure enjoyed it, (laughs) and they liked to complain. And it brought people together, and it really made for some bonding. And I thought I was getting the award for that, but during the presentation, my nominator recognized my other work. I've studied a bird called the double-crested cormorant for 35 years. They nest on the Bay Bridge and the Richmond Bridge. Interesting. So for years, I crawled over the bridge when I was a freelance biologist, and I had the great honor of designing the platforms that went onto the new Bay Bridge for the cormorants. So uh, for our listeners who might be Googling right now to see what one looks like, could you spell the name of the bird for us? A cormorant, C-O-R, M-O-R-A-N-T. It's a snaky-looking blackbird, and they, they're they always common here in Lake Merritt. In fact, they nest in the trees in Lake Merritt. You know, they're also... I've seen those. Yeah, people actually don't like them because uh, the poop, and the poop destroys the yeah. trees, and fishermen don't like them because they eat fish. And But I love them, and they need all the love they can get because they have adapted to a significantly altered urban bay, and that is the San Francisco, story of the San Francisco Quick Bay. Quick question. Did they take to the platforms that you designed for them? Felicia, thank you for answering that. That was the bane of my existence. The platforms were designed in 2001. They went up in 2006, 2007. The birds did not come by. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. And now the media was getting all over it. They were saying, this is a waste of money. This is a given chance. Do you move unless you absolutely have to? I say not right. <laughs> Do you procrastinate as long as you possibly as can? Pr- absolutely. As long as I possibly hey, you can. Know, we're, you know, we're just cormorants too. So the entire old bridge was removed down to the last bit of steel before th- those birds decided to take on their new digs. And uh, I, I remember it like it was yesterday, 2017, April the 1st, two birds, Adam and Eve, showed up. 20 days later, 400 birds had showed up. By the end of June, the whole colony had relocated. That's fantastic. In addition to winning the award, Mark, you have been busy this summer doing a project involving Stanford University. Can you tell us about that? Well, Rudy, you may not know this, but I was actually here teaching summer school all summer. First time I've ever done that. It was great. It was really great. I love the summer school students, uh, really focused. But I was honored to receive the competitive award called EPIC, which is the Educational Partnership for Internationalizing Curriculum that Stanford received from the Department of Energy. And 10 of us from around the state are working for a full-year fellowship to internationalize all of our curriculum. And I'm doing a, a very interesting and timely manner discussion of how climate change is affecting the politics, the geopolitics of Russia, the United States, particularly in Alaska, where the new frontier of militarization will be. You know, people look at the map and you hear the news, you think you think Ukraine and Russia and, and mm-hmm. we're supplying them is 10,000 miles away. Russia is 40 miles away from America up in Eastern Alaska. Alaska yeah. In Alaska. Mm-hmm. And the natives there think that they're in on the front lines of a future scenario. The situation is the ice is melting. Russia is exploiting the climate vulnerabilities of the ice. They're taking nuclear-powered icebreakers up 
they're escorting their liquid natural gas containers down through this narrow strait. It's, you can imagine in the winter with the rough weather, it's, it, a miscalculation of, of one degree mm -hmm. on your compass will end up being a, a flashpoint. I think it's like the new Straits of Hormuz. So with this fellowship, you're going to be designing new courses, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm taking the idea of Russia. Uh, you know, if the court, uh, let, me fr let me back on say, sure. it's easy to internationalize geography because geography is about the world. So it's about the human interactions with the planet and we all live in different places, speak different languages, have our own cultures, but it's ultimately the people and the planet. So it's easy for me to internationalize it my goal then is to create a world geography class, Geo3, we'll be offering in the spring, with a, an in-depth module that I'm delivering for the Stanford folks, looking at the biology, the geopolitics, and even the psychology of climate wow, so change many dimensions. and anthropology. It all started out, if I can take a minute. Sure. I was writing a book about, I used to live in Alaska, and I used to study the Bering Sea back in the 70s. And so now in my old age, I'm coming back to my roots because that place has changed so radically with climate change. And I was writing a book, and I thought, well, my, this book may never be published. So I took the material and submitted it to the Stanford program and, and was blessed to, to get in. But while I was writing the book, I realized, hey, I'm not really legitimately speaking for a people. So I needed to find a co-author, and I found a, and a very outspoken, articulate a Siberian Yupik man who lives on the island of St. Lawrence, which is mm -hmm. 40 miles from Siberia. And so he's my co-author, and I talk to him maybe once a month, and we're working on this together. So a couple things in your answer that I identify with that I'd like to share, and so glad to be welcoming Mar Professor Mark Razan on 96.9 KVPC. Mark, I lived in Japan for four years, and three mm -hmm. of those four years I lived mm -hmm on the coast that's opposite Tokyo, the, the one that's on the China Sea facing Siberia. Uh -huh. And one of my memories, fond and otherwise, was the Siberian wind fronts that mm -hmm. used to come into, the city was Niigata, where I used to live. Mm -hmm. So I remember that, so that's the first thing. But more importantly, I've been a really a, an admirer from afar of your discipline. When I was a student in France, my first subject matter course, meaning not learning to write in French, not learning to speak in French, not learning French grammar, but my first actual subject course was geography of France. That was my first experience taking a class in a language other than English. Ooh la la. And it was great. And I just, I felt like even though we never left the classroom, just had this wonderful experience as if we were traveling in this zone and getting to know the Alps, getting to know the uh, Pyrenees. and The Dolomites. Exactly. Just so many wonderful things in that experience. So I think about like Geography 1, and probably that's there's some similarity to that course. There's also Geography 1L, which is a lab. If a student enrolls in a Geography 1L class, what are they going to experience, especially leaving the classroom? And what type of assignments might they have? Well, I'm envious of both your Japanese experience of those Siberian blasts and, and your Wouldn't uh, trade them for anything. experience in France. Uh, that's a great background. Uh, so you are, your roots are in geography. But I'm glad you brought up the lab. The lab, as a matter of fact, has an opening. The lab is a late start. We'll be, opening, uh, we'll be starting on October the 11th. And what we do in the lab is augment what you do in the lecture. We also have two lectures that are opening up. So it, it drives home the lecture material. But because we live in such a unique position, that is, on the estuary that connects Lake Merritt with San Francisco Bay and the water flowing back and forth two times a day, we go out to the estuary and we sample the water. We make observations. We pull weeds. But we are getting our feet wet, so to speak, with how you become a scientist. You come up with a hypothesis, you collect data, and then you change your hypothesis as the data changes. So sure. uh, we're looking here in s at this time where we are soon, hopefully, to get fresh water in the form of big rainstorms coming into the system. Right now we've had a, a stagnant system, and hopefully we're gonna get some good flushing winter rains coming in that will change dissolved oxygen, the temperatures, the amount of salinity or salt in there. And, and let me just say one more thing that goes back to Felicia's question. The Fukushima earthquake 
in Japan in 2007 created mm. a tsunami wave that was very famous. It traveled, believe it or not, all the way across the Pacific. A little portion of it came into San Francisco Bay. Mm. A smaller portion came into Alameda. And a tiny bit of the wave came into the Lake Merritt estuary. And for uh, like 12 hours, you could see the needle on the tide gauge reverberating with the baby tsunami wave showing really the whole world is connected. That is amazing. Oh, yes. Gosh, other side of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Fuku actually, Fukushima. Fukushima. That was actually in the prefecture next to Niigata. So I, uh -huh. I've been there and I know it well. That's, that's something else. Well, it's coming to, it came visit knocking on your door. I'm a student, I'm looking at the catalog. Why should I take geography? Well, I think you've been a great spokesman for it right there. It's mind expanding. The world is changing and it's changing so fast. Students really need to get a handle on how to think about change, how to become a critical thinker, how to think in terms of systems rather than a series of facts. We need to step back as far as we can and open our minds as wide as they can work and look at how everything is related. Geography relates air, water, earthquakes, land, soil, organic material. COVID was a, a great leveter with that. Here's a disease coming from one part of the world to another, coming from the animal kingdom into the human population, moving around as we moved around, affecting our economies, affecting our health, differentially affecting different peoples depending on what their income was and where they live, uh, where they are on the planet, or what their political view was, what is their uh, income status, or their population position on the planet. So these changes, as we've indicated through climate change, will be affecting all of us. And you know, we pray for the folks who are in harm's way of Hurricane sure. Ian, major situations there. But what's the story? How does a hurricane form? How does an right. earthquake happen? So these are the, the premises. And it's your science credential. It's your ticket to your science AA credential. There you go. So you mentioned COVID and you mentioned change. As an instructor, what is life like for you over the last two years? COVID has changed everything for everybody, right? Sure. It how, how do we think about our students? How do the students think about their course modality? How do they learn best? You know, everyone was thrown into a remote situation and now we're crawling our way out. And we've learned so much about how people learn. How do students learn? What do students want? How does students success based on what their classroom or online experience is. Who's thriving? Who's not? So we're trying to unpack all this and present a, a menu of courses that are designed to try to bring everyone back and catch up for the educational losses that we have. Yeah, I certainly remember March 11th, 2020, and mm -hmm. kind of how things got started. And I think it was either on the 11th or 12th. Yep. You and I were sitting in the lab, you know, yeah, working you on were, Canvas and, and doing a couple of things. Instructing me to how to, I was so panicked. It was yeah. like, oh no, I have to go on so Canvas. So how have you changed as a teacher since then? Well, I'm a lot grayer. I've, <laughs> 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 I've learned to basically engage students in the online world by teaching synchronously. Essentially, I'm doing a podcast every day, right? You know, yeah. with the material. And just a, a quick word of explanation for our listeners. Uh, syn synchronous means an online class where you have a scheduled time to, to show up. Asynchronous is more you access the course on your availability. So just a, a little bit of info there. Please continue, Professor. Yeah, no, that's an important distinction. Synchronous means that you're there for the whole time, and I'm like your TV station. Asynchronous means you can dial I in. I like your explanation better <laughs> than mine, frankly. Go ahead, sir. Well, no, it's, you know, as a teacher, you're live and in person all the time, you mm -hmm. know, so we're always doing stand-up. And you have to be flexible and creative to keep students' attention because there are a lot of channels out there. And if I will say one thing has changed is that you are competing with a lot of channels that students have access to. It's true. And even while they're sitting in class, they're surfing and looking mm -hmm. for some other thing about their TikTok or Instagram or I, I guess they don't do Facebook anymore. Well, since we're talking about change, and, and now that, the, that we're back into the classroom, I walk around all the time, and one thing I did notice in looking at the estuary, that the water turned murky brown, and I even saw a, a sea lion swimming around in that murkiness and thinking, that doesn't look safe. 
can you explain to me? I, I started making phone calls and I found oh, out hang, it was an algae Felicia, bloom. Felicia, sea lion, how close to Laney? <laughs> it was pretty close. Oh, as in at Laney? <laughs> oh, wow. It was okay. at the district, At the though, district, okay. But mm -hmm. it, it was just right across the street from Laney. Oh, wow. That, uh -huh. That's just how, how close this, this mm -hmm. creature was. It was a district creature. <laughs> but I discovered it was an Ooh. algae bloom. Can you explain to me how that occurred? Yeah, it's a, we're at the end of a long, hot summer. The hot summer was also nurtured by a lot of pollution in the form of things called phosphates and nitrates that come out of the toilet and the East Bay Municipal Utility District's plants down in Emeryville. That treated material goes into the bay once all of the pollutants are removed, but you can't remove these chemicals, and they are the, the kind of fertilizer that algaes like and it was a, a coincidence of low fresh water, high temperatures, and a lot of fertilizers that allowed this thing called a brown algae to blossom, bloom, and float, and just suck up all the oxygen out of the water. It was not only in where you saw it, I took a ferry from Alameda to San Francisco, the whole bay was brown. It was only until you got over to the ferry building could you see some of the salt water coming in, mixing it up, the whole South Bay. Yeah, it so was right it's on the a water crisis. In Emeryville, it was there as well. Yeah, it was all over the news, but Lake Merritt was particularly bad, and it was a crisis in the sense. And I'm not exaggerating; it sucked all of the oxygen out of the water, mm. and the clams and the fish. Mm -hmm. I have a photos of 20 striped bass. All the clams died. All of the small fish died. It's mm. basically an ecological. It would be like ecological clear cutting, mm. and so we're. It's still. We still need a lot, we still have a long way to go to clean, to flush out the bay. And the, the sad news is that these brown algaes, when they flourish, they then pull themselves into like a spore or a seed and they sink to the bottom, waiting for the conditions waiting. to Too reoccur. Right. So yeah. I think a good winter set of rains will unbelievably help. Did you test with the students with that? No, because it's a late start and we haven't had a chance to do that. But, you know, you bring up a very good point because we don't want to get uh, in any kind of uh, nasty water situation. So we do use nitrile gloves. We do approach this. This is a, um, a COVID ty type of experience. We will be looking at it as we start in October. Mark, I'm curious. You've done uh, so much for Laney College over the years. One of the roles that you play currently is that you're the department chair of geography. What is it like leading your fellow peers? Well, we, we have a very small department. So compared to the folks in math and ESLO, ESL, we have four other colleagues. The biggest issue is what we're facing right now is making the spring schedule. Like I said earlier, how do we provide a menu? And, and we're guessing what do students want? So we're, you know, mm -hmm. you guys, what do you want? Let us know. There's a, a survey. We need to know what students want. Do you want online? Do you want half and half? Do you want to come at the mornings? Do you want to be asynchronous or asynchronous? So coming up with a schedule sure. uh, is, is a challenging thing. At the same time as we're seeing as student enrollment declines, so does our funding. And so we, it's always a, a challenge to well, balance that. You know what, though? You've met the challenge. I certainly remember those few months when I served as kind of your dean. Uh -huh. um, during that time, I've, I just always appreciated mm -hmm. our interactions and your insights on the schedule. And certainly speaking about courses that are beginning, not only geography, but we also on the 11th and then on the 18th, we have classes opening in sociology, psychology, math, ECT, which teaches uh, basically our HVAC or air conditioning systems and how they work, as well as communications and a host of other disciplines. As we close the show today, was there anything else you wanted to let our listeners know, maybe perhaps that I didn't ask you? Well, I've I have also want to shout out to you, Rudy, and your team for making Laney free. That is oh, an incredible. Fifteen percent more students than last year. That is yeah. an amazing gift to the community. It's not just to the students. It's just an amazing gift. And I hope, hey folks, take our class. It's free. Wow. There you go. And speaking of that, I wanted to come back, and I'm going to test you now, sir. What is the Laney motto? Dream, flourish, succeed. Dream, flourish, succeed. And I want to tell you an amazing story that comes down to this motto and I I'm a marine biologist also that kind of my background and I went out I was going to go out on the ocean on Sunday whale watching 
And I had an amazing dream on Saturday night that I was in the bottom of an aquarium and I looked up and I saw a sea turtle and I saw fish and coral, but the sea turtle I could see breathing. Well, cut to the chase. Go out on the trip, gorgeous day, flat calm, and saw whales and birds and seals. And at the end of the day, everyone's tired and we're coming back in. I put my binoculars up. I look out, turtle! Here was a sea turtle on the water. And it was like, am I hallucinating? I had dreamed this, and now here wow. it is. The amazing. boat came around. Everyone saw this sea turtle. And, and the amazing thing is, Felicia, you don't see them here. This was a turtle that was on nobody's radar. The experts had no idea what it was. It shouldn't have been here. And I dreamt it. I saw it. And I made it happen. So the point is, you can dream. And you can dream big. And you can make your dreams happen. You can manifest them. You can manifest them here at Laney. You can flourish. And you can seek fulfillment. And then Absolutely, you can... Yeah. No, be fulfilled. And at Laney College, our job is supporting students as they right. try, students to, try first. to achieve those dreams. Students Mark, first. thank you so much for joining us today. This My has been an incredible, uh, incredible conversation, and we certainly look forward to having you back sometime. As we wrap up another edition of the President's Desk, we want to thank our listeners, especially those tuning in from Lake Merritt, Oakland Chinatown, Downtown Oakland, West Oakland, East Lake, Fruitvale, Diamond, North Oakland, Adams Point, Central Oakland, East Oakland, the Oakland Hills, Montclair, Piedmont, and of course those right here on the Laney campus joining us. As we close up shop at the President's desk, straighten up the chairs, and turn off the desk light, Felicia, take us home. Thank you for tuning in to the President's Desk, a program available on radio and podcast hosted by Laney College President Dr. Rudy Besikoff. It airs each Wednesday at 2 a.m. and 2 p.m. on 96.9 KGPC. To listen to the podcast anytime, find us on KGPC 969.org forward slash current shows and click on the President's Desk. If you have a suggestion for a future show, please email us at laneypio at peralta.edu.